Okay. I'm very excited to share this episode with you guys today. This episode is with Alex Theverge. He is a licensed marriage and family therapist um, based out of San Francisco, and he specializes in psychedelic integration and support. Um, You guys may know, or if this is my intro, your intro to my podcast, I am a huge advocate of plant medicines, especially when facilitated by a trained um, shaman, medicine worker, therapist, and Alex is actually both. So he is a trained therapist and he's also um, studied ayahuasca shamanism in the Peruvian Amazon. So he's been exploring psychedelics himself for 25 years. Um, and he spent several years living in Peru studying shamanism and facilitating plant medicine ceremonies. And he continues to lead plant medicine retreats to Peru. Um, previously, he worked at the University of California, San Francisco's Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute, where he was a therapist and program manager in the partial hospitalization program. Um, He actually has a degree in Latin American studies from Columbia. So super smart guy, very well spoken on this subject. He shares how he himself got into this practice. And I was so interested in it because I think it is such a beautiful blending of Western. uh, Well, I guess it's all, it's it's all kind of Western because this is most of this is from South America, but you know, from our conventionally Western medicine approach or therapy therapy, you know, he was trained in the United States as a therapist, but then went and learned the ancient healing practices from South America and has now brought those two together. Um, He has a 15 year history working in diverse clinical and healing settings, including community mental health, psychiatric emergency services, residential treatment, and hospice care. So anyway, I I'm really excited to jump into, we talk about, you know, not only how he got into the ayahuasca world, which the story is really cool. Um, and I think we'll, a lot of you can probably relate to where he was at when he found it. Um, but then we talk about common experiences people have, what is that experience actually like? So maybe you don't even know what I'm talking about right now. You're like, what is this word she's saying? (laughs) But you know, ayahuasca, he's going to explain what it is, the type of experience experiences people have, the benefits he's seen, um, some things to watch out for. Um, some people are scared to try ayahuasca and as he puts it, understandably, <laughs> and he talks about some, you know, some reasons, some things that they check for in people before they actually go into those kind of spaces. He talks about the art of shamanism and, and, and how they approach things and how they're able to move energy through people. And I've experienced it myself. And, you know, I mentioned later in the episode that for me, ayahuasca was true turning point in my life. Um, and I'm, I'm forever grateful for it. And so that's why I bring these kind of episodes to you guys, because I'm really just trying to bring the most powerful transformation tools that I know of to your attention. And this is definitely one of them. So very excited to jump in. Here is Alex the Verge. Okay. Before we jump into the show, I've got a special announcement real quick, and it is about my higher retreats. We are finally rolling on this. This is a project that's been in the work for two years for me, and we are finally going. Our first higher retreat is going to be in April in Zion's National Park. I don't know if you've ever been to Zion, but oh man, it's in Southern Utah. It is incredible. Check out my Instagram for pictures if you haven't seen. It is just like one of the most magical places in the world. People come from all over the world to see this place. Um, So we are going to be doing it there April 21st through 24th, 2022. And I wanted to let you guys know we are still in our early bird pricing right now. Um, We sold a lot of it. We filled more than half the retreat in our pre-sale, but we still have one shared room left. So if you want to come with somebody and save some money, jump on that. Um, I am doing this with Be The Wellness. They are helping me put on this retreat. Be The Wellness is amazing. They are like my dream end goal of all retreats. And they have decided to help other people like me put on retreats. So it's going to be phenomenal. They're award-winning retreat um, hosts. And yeah, it's it's going to be good. So you have to go to their website. It's going to be Be The Wellness. So B-E-E. Make sure you follow them on Instagram, by the way, also. But B-E-E, The Wellness, be the wellness.com slash experiences slash hire. All of the details are there. You have pricing. Um, you can register right there on the website. All of the schedule, all of the people who are coming. We have a shaman coming to do a fire ceremony the first night. There's an amazing yoga, meditation, breathwork facilitator. Catherine Dixon, who is like, I don't know what to call her, my like spiritual guide in life. <laughs> um, she is facilitates the work of Byron Katie and she has an episode here on Inside Out Health. I would highly suggest listening to that. She is a life changer. She's going to be facilitating um, two days at the retreat. So I'm so excited to have Catherine coming. She's like my secret weapon. She's amazing. So 
Um, yeah, all the details are on that website. Go check it out. Take advantage of the early bird pricing we have going um, for the next uh, week and a half. So that will end on, I guess, maybe it's a little less than that by the time you hear this. That ends on August 8th at 8 p.m. So 888, okay? August 8th at 8 p.m. Mountain Time is when the early bird pricing ends. So if you want to get in on that, get in on that now. Um, and yeah, if this is something that's pinging, if you feel like you need a reset, connect to nature, connect with like-minded people, take a look inside at what you got going on and leave with some tools on how to control your stress response and challenge your stressful thoughts and find out what might be going on inside of you that you're just not seeing. This is going to be amazing. We have a private chef coming, all gourmet paleo meals. It's going to be incredible. So um, yeah, check that out. Bethewellness.com slash experiences slash hire. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test. There's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of, exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it, guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Alex, thank you for coming on today and talking about ayahuasca, trauma healing, um, integrating plant medicines. I'd like to talk to uh, you about today because this is something you've been doing for a long time. Um, I know right now, (laughs) sometimes I personally, just me, I sometimes I'm like, I wish ayahuasca wasn't the most popular plant medicine out there. That's like buzzword. Cause I think it's a very, very like advanced, intense medicine that needs a lot of preparation. And it's not just like, Oh, I'm going to go on yeah. vacation to Costa Rica, or Peru, and like drop in a little ayahuasca ceremony real quick. And then go on my, <laughs> go on my Machu Picchu tour. It's like, Whoa, it's, it's a pretty intense experience. And so I was wondering if we could start though with, you know, you've been doing this a long time, um, have spent time down in the, the Amazon on studying ayahuasca and shamanism. And so I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that journey for you and, and why you got into this, how you got into it, and then what you've learned over the past, you know, 25 years in this space as to why it's something that you still continue to support, um, as a healing modality for people. Sure. Um, well, I have 25 years of working with psychedelics, but the ayahuasca, my life with ayahuasca is much more recent. Okay. Um, and how that started was I, I was a psychotherapist in private practice in San Francisco um, for many years and had really reached kind of a plateau in my life. I just, I felt like kind of nothing was working. I was not enjoying my practice. I was not enjoying San Francisco. I was mm-hmm. not feeling connected in my relationships. Just kind of nothing was working. And I made a decision in 2000 and. 12 to basically close everything down and um, go on an endless kind of, you know, indeterminate world travel trip, which I did um, and was hoping in that process, I would find out kind of what the next chapter is. I really had no idea. At that point, I thought I was like done with therapy forever. Wow. 
And I spent a year and a half uh, traveling around mostly um, East Asia, North Africa, Middle East, and, and then eventually Latin America. Um, wow. Came back for a bit, I thought maybe I was ready to come back to the US and I did come back to the US temporarily, but realized uh, you know, I, I wasn't ready. I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. So when <laughs> spent another few months traveling in South America and in that process, I was in Peru. Um, I have friends here in the Bay Area. Uh, one in particular has been a long time part of an ayahuasca community. She's always been trying to get me to do it. Kind of timing never worked out. And uh, so I was, you know, my philosophy of travel is always, you know, do what the region is known for. So when I was in Peru and I wanted to go to the Amazon, I was like, well, this is what it's known for is this incredible practice, which I'd heard a lot about. Mm -hmm. And having had a lot of experience with psychedelics before it intrigued me. Yeah. So that's how I got started. I was basically just traveling. My main intention actually with that first retreat uh, was to hopefully get some life direction because that was really the issue. I mean, I was pretty happy with, um, you know, the, the, the travel had really worked for me. You know, that was, it was like what, what I needed. So I was emotionally in a great place, but still lacking direction. And, mm -hmm. um, that was my first interest in ayahuasca. I ended up going back several times and eventually moving to Peru. And I spent three years in the Amazon um, apprenticing with uh, a traditional maestro of ayahuasca medicine, working at a retreat center and eventually you know, facilitating retreats and helping to run the center. Wow. Um, so none of that I could have planned, obviously, or knew yeah. that was going to happen, but it just unfolded in that way. Wow. Okay. So what, you know, for somebody, maybe we've had episodes about ayahuasca previously on the show, but if somebody, if this is their entry point and they're like, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> what would you tell them? I would tell them it's uh, ayahuasca is a traditional plant medicine from the Amazon. It's a, it's a mixture of different plants two primary ingredients, the vine ayahuasca and shakruna, which is a small shrub. Um, and the ayahuasca medicine has some very unique properties, um, one of which is it's a purgative. And so it is an incredible, powerful releaser of things inside of us. And that transcends all realms of human experience, physical release, emotional release, mental, energetic, spiritual. And mm -hmm. I haven't found anything like it. I've, you know, you know, in my travels, I was also looking at different healing modalities and experimenting with different approaches. I've not found anything in the Western or non-Western world that has this capacity to immediately eject things from us that don't belong anymore, that are holding us back, sometimes that we've been carrying around our whole lives. Mm -hmm. um, in the very surprising way, people often have experiences of Re releasing either, you know, vomiting or sometimes emotionally or in other ways, s feeling a release of something they didn't even know was bothering them. Yeah. And that's really kind of the miracle of it is when you actually release things you didn't even know were weighing you down. And of course, then you feel much lighter. So yeah. I would say that's a fundamental property. It is a visionary uh, medicine, which means it creates psychedelic visions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it can be fairly intense. It's an altered state of consciousness. It lasts for several hours, the kind of meat of the experience. Um, and it has some deeply spiritual qualities. I think most people who have an experience with ayahuasca or continue with it to some degree, even if they're totally, you know, non-believing in anything beyond the material world or atheists, they tend to come away with an experience of like, okay, there's something beyond what, I thought I knew was the world or the universe. Yeah. So it has a, a spiritual opening capacity as well. Yeah. I can see why you're so drawn to it as, I mean, even as a therapist, you're basically a healer, right. Or facilitating healing for people. Yeah. And I know for me, just in coaching, I, 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 you know, I've told people many times, I'm like, you know, there's those things out there that you can recommend to people and they might get like a 1% change in their life. Like, yeah. Hey, take vitamin C or, you know, like you get, there's things like that. Right. And I was like, and then there's the tools where it's like, 
this will absolutely 100% change your life. I have no doubt about it. Like this is, you know, the, the, the absolutes. And and for me, it's such a powerful transformation tool because it's so healing. Just like you talked about, like so often, I think the reason it's difficult for us to change patterns in our lives that aren't serving us is because we don't understand that we don't even know what's going on there's something internally. It's like, we can't identify it. And for me, plant medicines come in and they help you identify identify those things and remove those stories. And I, ayahuasca to me, I was just talking to someone about this last night. I'm like, it's, it's completely on another level to me than, than the other plant medicines, because the, at least from my experience, the healing capacity of it is so strong, but like physically, like I felt things happening in my body where I had injuries. (laughs) I've like, felt, I'm like, I felt like little Pac-Man was going around in there. I don't know what was going on. Um, I slept through Yahe, like our most intense journey. I slept through the whole thing. And I just can only imagine that there must've been some, I was like, I guess I needed, like, I had to go under anesthetics. (laughs) I mean, I must've needed some deep healing. Um, and, uh, and on top of it, you know, I, had experienced like seeing my parents through the eyes of God, like as if they were my own children, like, mm-hmm. and the compassion and love. And, you know, so all these, these deep, deep, um, healing beautiful mindset shifts that yeah. happen on top of it, connections to my kids. It's just, it's, it's so multivariate. And, and this is what I, I actually would really love to ask you. Um, so because psychedelics are becoming increasingly well-known and, you know, people mm-hmm. have had these experiences and they're like, wow, this completely changed my life. And uh, it's not uncommon for people to get a bit obsessed in the beginning with what yes. else is there. Yeah. And I see two, I personally have two concerns and I am curious your thoughts. One is this, um, frequency of like almost wanting to buffet psychedelic experiences, like this obsession of like, if I just go in to that space, what else can I uncover? What else can I uncover? And there's no integration time and it becomes almost Mm -hmm. overwhelming. And the other question I, I have for you, if we can piggyback these is, um, I know people who are like live locally in Utah and are not trained in shamanism at all and are brewing ayahuasca in their house and just doing yeah. it with people. And yeah. for some reason for me, like, I'm like, nee, mushrooms, maybe. Yeah. Like, right. but ayahuasca, I feel like is such a shamanic medicine. I feel like there's yes. something deeply um, uh, important about the tradition. And so I was wondering if you could talk about frequency of experiences and the importance of yeah. integration. And then also why it's important to have a shaman facilitate these experiences with ayahuasca. Yeah. Happy to speak to both of those. So the, uh, the first one, um, yeah, I think there, there are some people who get really drawn into it on a, usually what I see with this is, uh, what I call like the seeker personality. Yeah, They're just looking for more. They're looking, but they don't really know what they're looking for. There's something right either missing or something that they're they're trying to reach for, but they don't know what. And it leads right. them to just do kind of endless amounts of psychedelics or exploring all these different spiritual modalities. Right. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that in and of itself, but it can end up being somewhat of an escapist mm-hmm. uh, process where they're not really facing what the underlying issue is. Like, mm. um, so to me, psychedelics at their best help you to get in touch with your own innate truth and healing and the reality that everything you need is within you, is available inside. They help you to connect with that. If it becomes a tool of self looking externally, externally for answers, for love, for all the goodness out there in the world, it can be very um, self-defeating, meaning it's, it's actually not helping you to grow. It can actually right. keep you stuck in a pattern. Right. So that's definitely one thing I see. Um, And then in terms of integration, I mean, you're, you're kind of, my opinion, the most effective way to work with these things is to really take time between them. So just rushing back. And I I know when I first, I had, you know, five ceremonies in Peru, I wanted to come back like next month, I was blown Mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. But it really did help that I waited for several months. And then when I came back, I was really ready to do Mm to go further. And so Mm -hmm. letting, you know, these experiences are so powerful. They take months to play out in your life. The changes that happen, even if you're not, you know, doing integration officially or getting help with it, it still takes months for those shifts. You don't even know what's shifted sometimes until you're out in the world, interacting with people, 
seeing how you react differently now and that your yep. preferences maybe have changed. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, it's better to wait and, um, you know, and let it, let that yeah. develop before you go back further. Yeah. And then what about your thoughts on, uh, you know, somebody just brewing ayahuasca in their house and doing it? <laughs> yeah, I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> you know, I think with other things like mushrooms and mm. other psychedelics, you can, you know, if you go in with intention and do some basic practices, you can get a lot out of it and you can do it pretty safely for the most part for most mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca is not like that. It's a very different medicine. Um, there's a reason why there's a shamanic tradition around it, which is, you know, how to wield this medicine in a way that's effective and that's helpful. Certainly people can do ayahuasca and, you know, on their own with no guidance and it can go fine, certainly. But what can also happen is it opens things up things come out that you don't know how to deal with or clear. Right. <laughs> this happens a lot. This happens in ceremonies all the time. And right. part of the work of the facilitator is to move these things out. So they're not stuck. Yeah. And so the worst case scenario, or one of the worst case scenarios is you're, you're using this on your own or with others, things come up for someone they're unable to move them. And now they're stuck with this weird darkness, negative thoughts, right. and feelings that persist way after the ceremony is over for months, years right. sometimes. And I've right. seen this. Mm -hmm. So I definitely don't recommend that. It's, this is not one to be trifled with. You want to be very careful with ayahuasca. And also, you know, not all facilitators or ayahuasqueros are at the same level. Like you want to really make sure they know what they're doing. They know how to invoke the medicine. The spirits come when they call them, they're able to clear things out. That takes years of relationship building. That's not something you can just snap your fingers or copy a song you heard on YouTube or play it in the background and yeah. get that. That is right. what shamanism is about, which is a relationship between you and the spirits. So with ayahuasca, you can always just ingest the physical materials and kind of see what happens, but it's a little like Russian roulette. It could be fine. You could have a great experience, but mm -hmm. you could also have a really bad experience that has negative ramifications. So to my mind, it's, it's just not worth it, you know, yeah, do it with someone who knows what they're doing it in a safe environment. So this is something I really am excited to ask you about, because one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you is because you have so much experience in traditional therapy and you yeah. have shamanic training. That's really cool. Like, cause I I've actually been looking for that, like for people that I know that have like severe trauma, you know, yeah. I, although I, 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 I do completely trust like a really good shaman, you know, to be able to move that energy. I'm like, what is that like? If you also are trained in helping people get through PTSD and severe traumas, yeah. like, has that been, how has that been for you having both of those tools in your tool belt? Do you feel like it's enhanced your ability to yeah. help people through those ceremonies? Uh, definitely. They're very complimentary. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's really more about the longer arc of the, of the healing versus just the ceremony. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. right. you know, helping someone during a ceremony, you don't need to be a trained psychotherapist to do that. You know, yeah. if you're service oriented and you're able to be present with people and you have yeah. a an ability to not insert your own kind right. of issues into an interaction, mm -hmm. then, you know, lots of people can do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say the, the difference is how you hold people afterwards and how to make sense of what happened and how to use that to continue to work and make changes mm -hmm. in your life. That's one thing where having that background really helps because, you know, I can, I can see where they could go after and mm -hmm. um, how to, basically make the most out of what they experience, how to make sense of it, and then how to use that for transformation over yeah. a longer period. And then another thing, of course, is if I know the person I'm working with them um, in like on a therapy setting, then in the ceremony, obviously, I, I, I know more about what they need. And I can use right. that a lot more in terms of right. healing than I could with someone that I just met. And I'm trying to assess what, you know, right. what's happening in ceremony that they might need. 
Right. That is super, super valuable to have somebody coming in in that context for, before. So when stuff comes up, that's it's understood. Yep. You already know the context. Yep. You're able to be like, ah, oh, that makes sense. And, and yes. carry them through. that's, that's a, re- and then, and then also after that's yep. really amazing. I mean, I, I've thought about that often. I'm like, I, although I value the ayahuasca retreat centers and everything, I'm like, I think it would be more beneficial for people if they had like coaching at, yeah. before and after Definitely. this experience, you know? So it's basically what you're offering like in yeah. therapy before and after for some of your people, I guess. Some are doing that. Um, it's definitely on the rarer side. Okay. Um, you know, they're m- mo- I would say there's like a, a couple that I know of where they okay. offer that, but mainly yeah. it's, you know, they're, they're a retreat experience, meaning you right. go there, you're immersed in their world and then you go home. Right. And I totally agree with you. And I, I certainly saw this when I worked at a retreat center that so much happens after and that, yeah, you can do a tremendous amount of healing during those, you know, two weeks or week, but you can do a lot more if you keep working with it and have support and guidance on, you know, what's coming up. Cause often things will come up at home. That's one right. thing you know, you have your experience, you feel blissed out and cleared Mm -hmm. and you feel great. And then you go back to your home life and then more stuff starts coming up and more feelings and memories and patterns that you're seeing. And it can be a bumpy ride after an intense experience like that. And then the other thing is people are going back to the same environment they left. So they may have changed a lot, but the structures in their life are the same. And so there's going to be friction there. And so you, it really helps to have some intentional work on how to, you know, integration isn't just integrate the experience for you inside you, it's integrating you back into your former life and some things may need to change. Mm. And so it helps to have support, you know, and, and yeah. guidance and around that. Yeah, totally. One thing that I've noticed in people, as I talk to them about ayahuasca is fear of what might come up. Right. Yeah. So I think some, they're, they're too afraid to do it. Even me, like, um, I had had many, many, many psychedelic experiences before ayahuasca. So like you, I was very intrigued by it. I was very interested. I was very yeah. comfortable in the altered state. And so I couldn't wait. So I was like, Oh, I, I, I don't care. Let me poop my pants and puke all over the place. I know it's going to be right. good for me. And like, I don't, whatever demons I have to face, let's go baby. Cause I know it's just going to be for my greater good. But I noticed that first night of medicine, there were several people we stood around that, you know, I had one guy, he's like, I, I almost didn't come. I, I was like, had mm. told myself I'm not flew, flew yeah. all the way to Costa Rica. And then was right. going to just stay in his room because he was too scared. And I had a few other people tell me that. So I know this is even the people who have made the jump, they paid for the retreat and flown out of the country. They're like, yeah. crap, I can't do it. I'm too scared of what's going to come yeah. up. What do you say to those people? Uh, that's very understandable. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say it's, it's very common. I it's kind of the first task is dealing with fear. Mm -hmm. And so, um, because it's, it's natural, you're going into an unknown, right? You don't know what's going to come up, how it's going to affect you, uh, especially if they've never had psychedelic experience before. Very understandable. Totally. The, uh, you know, the, what I tell them is the best thing you can do is relax as much as possible. Try to relax your body, try to relax your mind during the experience leading into it going in there as much as possible with the relaxed state and knowing that you are working with a substance that is a medicine, it's here to help you. Whatever comes up, even if it's unpleasant or negative or dark or scary, it's coming up as part of a process of healing. Yep. So it's not coming up to haunt you or to scare you or to inflict, you know, pain on you. It's coming up as part of a process of letting go. Yeah. And it, that really is how it works. It's dredging things up inside of us. Yeah. Sometimes it's stuff's not pretty, you know, yeah. sometimes it's things we, we don't really want to look at, you know, yep. they're not, they're not <laughs> pretty things to look at and not parts yep. of ourselves we don't like, or we're not proud of, but yep. it's dredging that up to help release it or heal it in some way. And so yeah, trusting the medicine and really, you know, I do find that surrender is the best approach. You know, once you're in, you've made a commitment. Once you drink that cup, you've made a commitment. You put yourself in ayahuasca's hands. There's no undoing that, right? It's right. once it's in there, it's just the process has to, has to, you know, happen, which can take a few hours. So just surrender completely to the experience. And that is the smoothest thing. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the smoothest way you can go about it. So even if it's 
ups and downs and intense, if you're just constantly relaxing into it, I surrender, I let go. What happens is the ego is trying to hold on and it just can't. It's just, it's beyond what the self can <laughs> control. It's overwhelming to the ego. Right. And so it's fighting and it's trying to hold on and get a grip. And that yeah. just creates more friction and more turbulence. Mm. So relax, surrender, relax, surrender. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a friend recently, um, we just did a, a mushroom journey. Um, but she had a lot of stuff come up, like you're speaking of, of just stuff. She didn't, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to, I want out. I like, I, you know, and, um, and we were talking through it and she was like, why do you do this? (laughs) Like, why would you ever want to do this? And I I just told her, I'm like, because I get so much benefit out of it. And sometimes the journeys are like this, but they're always for my greater good. And now after the fact, like, she's, she's like, I, I can't wait to yeah. do it again. Oh my gosh. That was like, so eye opening. I needed to see yeah. that. And that's, it's usually what it is, is, you know, I, even on without plant medicines, the stuff that we're not willing to see in ourselves is the stuff that stays in there. And so I feel like plant medicines yeah. are very helpful. The, the way I like to say it is like the medicine goes into your, into your psyche. And it's like, here you go, deal with it. Yep, <laughs> you know, it finds just the things that you need yeah. to deal with. And it's like, here you go, you're going to deal with that now, you know? And it's, yeah always in love. I feel like it's always for our greatest good. And I was wondering, I don't know if you um, would feel comfortable, but I was wondering if you could share any, you know, outcomes, any, like, you know, people probably like, well, what, what do I get out of ayahuasca? Do you have any like stories of benefits? Sure. I mean, endless, um, (laughs) really endless. I've worked with thousands of people. So the, you know, everything from chronic untreatable depression and it getting cleared in a few, you know, five ceremonies and not coming back. They are no longer suicidally depressed to, you know, deep childhood trauma that was healed. You know, there's a a kind of a shamanic concept of soul retrieval, a part of yourself that was split off at a Mm -hmm. young age due to a terrifying experience Mm -hmm. and them having a subjective experience of that part coming back and feeling whole for the first time in their lives. Lots of experiences of release of painful memories, painful experiences that ends up changing their relationships with people in their lives today, but even their relationship with the past. And um, reconnecting to their inner child, inner innocence, you know, seeing themselves growing up in a ceremony from, you know, all that they went through and, and for the first time getting in touch with that playful, loving, joyous child inside of them. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the stories are really um, endless. What I find most interesting are experiences where people either are purging something and they can see what it is. And this is really common. It's happened to me many times where as you're vomiting it out, you get an image of what you're releasing. So it's like you're, you're wow. purging, you're literally verm- vomiting and there's an image of That's you awesome. know, some kid teasing you in wow. third grade. You didn't realize how much of it stuck with you. Wow. Or experiences kind of like what you said, where it's working on a body part. And I've had yeah. this happen many times with clients. They don't understand why all of a sudden it's really working on the time. I don't get it. Like, what is that about? And then eventually realizing and seeing that that was related to either a physical or emotional trauma that happened yeah. at that time, yep. you know, and that could be from 15 years ago. I've had experiences yep. where, you know, someone eventually, you know, they come up to me after the ceremony and say, you know, that thing I was talking about in my arm, it actually turned out to be, I saw it, this, this, this scary thing that happened when I was 12 and it completely cleared out and my arm feels fine and I feel much better. Yeah. And so there's a lot of experiences like that. I mean, kind of countless. Um, But I would say the bottom line is people feel better after. And to me, this is one of the differences between ayahuasca and some other psychedelics. Sometimes you feel better with other psychedelics after, definitely. But for me, it's very consistent. After an ayahuasca ceremony, people feel like a million bucks. They just, they feel clear. They feel clean. Their energy feels very refined um, Mm -hmm. and lighter. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's about. It's, you know, the experience itself isn't to me, especially at this point, it's not that interesting. It's like, that is just the thing you do to get the benefits. And it could be beautiful visions. It could be horrible visions, but that's not really why we're there. We're there because it's transformational to our lives over the long run. 
Yeah. I, I, um, was just telling my friend last night, this, there was a woman at my retreat who she was an older woman and she just had that, her face just looked so bogged down by life. You know, she just looked almost mm-hmm. angry, you know, and, yeah. and, um, you know, was kind of complaining to everyone about how hard her life was and all the hardships that she had the, yep. a lot, you know, and then by the end of it, she just transformed into this like beautiful, angelic woman. Like she had long white hair. Her face was just radiant. She was just smiling at everyone. She was silent and like quiet a lot. She wasn't talking as much. She was just radiantly like beaming and I'll never forget it. I was just like, wow, you just went from like anger and bitterness and resentment to like a walking angel that is beaming light out of your soul. Like it was so cool to see that. And I'm sure you've seen that change in countenance and a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the retreat center lifestyle is really hard. And the one thing that gets us through to me, and it's why I kept doing it was you would see a group come in at the beginning and you see them when they leave and everyone is lighter and brighter and happier and people that were mired in negativity, exactly as you're describing are like free of that. And it's remarkable. And I don't know anything where in a week you can have such a tremendous change. And so that really, you know, if you're, you know, your goal in life or your, your primary direction is to help people and and do healing work. That is very compelling because you're seeing healing happen so quickly and it's, it makes it worth it. All the efforts and the sacrifices that are involved with it. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, I I don't even know if you go this route because you have shamanic training. Um, and I know it's, it's more of a spiritual thing than like a science based, you know, practice, but I'm curious, do you know anything, or do you have any thoughts about, you know, what happens neurochemically? What, what, what's happening inside our bodies to be able to create this space? Do you know, do you even go down that road? (laughs) I mean, I, I do just because I'm interested, I mm-hmm. like looking at things from kind of all the levels of human yeah. experience, including the brain chemistry level. There really hasn't been much research on it. Right. I'm like, you know, psilocybin mushrooms and LSD and MDMA right. have been studied a lot more. Right. Um, you know, what we do know is it, it obviously it's a flood of serotonin uh, receptors being activated by um, ayahuasca, not just the DMT in there, but there are many compounds in the vine that also are psychoactive. And, you know, people have looked, I think, um, Dennis McKenna in particular at like which exact receptors are activated, how long that kind of thing. He's Mm -hmm. really into the biochemistry of it. Mm -hmm. Um, In terms of what that does inside of us, we know a little bit that some create more of a visionary states and some create more mood effect, depending Mm -hmm. on which subtype of serotonin receptor in the brain is being hit. but we don't, we know a lot less than what we do know, you know, yeah. we know very yeah. little amount. Um, what I find most interesting is that, you know, the Western kind of scientific model is very interested in the DMT because that is the part that creates the visions. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, t- it really uh, traditionally, uh, traditionally in the Western world up till recently, it's really just looked at Ayahuasca is just the MAO inhibitor that allows the DMT to get through the blood brain barrier into your brain. Mm -hmm. And that's all it, that's all its purposes, right? But in the Amazon, they don't call it Shakruna, they call it Ayahuasca, meaning the vine is where the medicine is. And the Shakruna with the DMT is considered, as my teacher said, it's what turns on the light. So you can see what's happening, but it's not Mm -hmm. the cause of what's happening. Wow. And so the ayahuasca vine is the spirit that we're working with. The ayahuasca mm. vine is where the medicine and that's the healing capacity. Wow. The shakruna gives us the light to see what is going on in terms of this healing. Wow. Now what's happening more and more recently is we're understanding as they're studying ayahuasca and particularly some of the compounds in it, that it has a lot of healing properties that are very early level studies, but including neurogenerative properties for compounds like harmaline, and the different harmaline compounds in ayahuasca, as well as potentially being able to regrow, I think it was um, uh, liver cells, like they've done some Petri dish studies. So they're starting to see that, oh, wow, there actually is medicine and medicinal properties to the ayahuasca. It's not just the DMT. But again, I would say the tradition, Amazonian traditions know a lot more than the kind of Western 
approach wow. right now. Yeah. And, and can you, can you share how this brew was created about where the ayahuasca vine and Shakuna come from? Yeah. No that? one knows. I mean, oh, really? Uh, Is that not yeah. true? Is that just like old wives tales that it was like from to- two totally different sides of South America that they were like brought together. Is that not true? Not that I know of. I mean, no, oh, okay. there, there is no, the, the problem is there's no written history in the Amazon, yeah. right? Okay. So um, there's no way to know. All we know yeah. um, is basically from anthropology. Right. Right. So okay. they're kind of piecing together based on practices, how ayahuasca has um, kind of moved around the Amazon. There's different ideas of where yeah. maybe it started. Right. But in terms of what made them pick out of tens of thousands of species of plants and trees, uh-huh. pick this one vine and there's lots yeah. of vines in the Amazon and this one little shrub and right. brew it together, you know, in a tea and boil it. That is a mystery. And yeah. you know, what uh-huh. the, the, what, you know, the teachers will tell you as well, you know, we learned from our ancestors and our ancestors were taught by the plants directly, like the spirits yeah. told them and that's yeah. the world they live in, you know? So it makes right. a lot of sense. Well, you know, not to, weird anybody out who's never done plant medicines before, but once you do, you do, you do learn that the, the, the plants yeah. do teach you, you know, however yeah. you want to look at that. It's like, I ingested exactly. a plant and my whole life got changed. And I yeah. have noticed something that's been interesting to me is I have noticed that as people do these medicines, they become more connected to the earth, more protectors yes. of mother earth, more yeah. aware and grateful. And so it's very interesting to me because I've seen that experience yeah. happen over and over and people and myself. So, same, same cool. for me personally. And from working with people, that is, I, I would say one of the most uh, common experiences, the one that shows up the most is an increased reverence for the natural world, our interdependence with it and yes. kind of the magic of nature beyond the human, mm-hmm. you know, realm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a reverence for that, a lot of people end up wanting to protect and I, I I know I have, I've gotten involved in trying yeah. to protect, conserve nature and both too. locally and in the Amazon. And, you know, it's, it makes you really appreciate, um, mm. that these medicines are incredibly healing and that the natural world has a lot more intelligence than we really can even begin to understand, even though, mm. you know, humans are very intelligent in a very particular way we really don't know a lot <laughs> and yeah. the the plant world and the natural world is filled with incredible amounts of intelligence that we just can't begin to under we're just beginning to understand it's just scratching the surface yeah 100% um are there other like really really common experiences you've noticed like a lot of people have this happen this comes up um in terms of like content, uh, to that the connection with nature is, I would say a, a main one. Um, I would say overall, um, you know, there is a general feeling of, um, kind of more reverence for life and, and, yeah. and like just being alive and appreciation yeah. of what an incredible blessing it is and yeah. how special it is. Totally. Um, in terms of like actual content, I would say those that and 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 like I said before, like a spiritual understanding that there's more than just what m- my mind pieces together in terms of like three dimensional reality or a yeah. connection to beyond the self. That's yeah. another one, and yeah. that to me is one of the most healing things in the modern world because we're so disconnected mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. things beyond the self. We're in a yeah. world where it's all about the mind and the ego and the self. Right. And so to be able to transcend that even temporarily and connect to and feel connected to something beyond self is really powerful and life changing. And it I know is. for me, my first experience with that, even with psychedelics in general, changed yeah. my life forever. Totally. You know, somebody, I had a big life transformation and somebody asked me once, like, what was like the point? If you had to identify like a point that it like yeah. really shifted for you, I was yeah. like, ayahuasca. That's when yeah. everything, because for me, it was a combination of like heart healing, like restoring yeah. me to like the tr- truest essence of who yeah. I am, like all of my goodness. I became yep. 
deeply reconnected with that and also a very deep sense of purpose and mission and, and, and serving mm-hmm. others and protecting mother earth and yeah. um, deep connection to my children and honoring my parents and ancestors and like just wow. this very like centered place. Yeah. And when you're there and you feel that sense of purpose and mission, it's like, you kind of become, it's like, I feel like, I felt like I became unstoppable, but it wasn't like, it's not hard. It's like, it, it's yeah. just my, my desires are so based in goodness. And I'm so yeah. grateful for that. And my, my self-love and my self-honoring and yeah. honoring of the, the, I don't even know what it is that guides me, spirit guides, aliens. I have no idea. Something's guiding me, God, <laughs> right. and, you know, whatever you word you want to put on it, like something is guiding me in my life. And like that, I was already there, but after ayahuasca, it's just like, it's so centered in me, you know? And yeah. Like, and I, I want that. I, I, I want everybody. I, I feel very fortunate to be in yeah. the space that Same. I'm in. And so that's why I have guests like you and, and, and try to get the word out. Cause I'm like, it's not fair. It would be selfish for me to yeah. keep that to myself because I'm like, man, people could, there's so much, I know that there's going to be suffering, but there's so much unnecessary suffering that we yeah. actually have tools to help with, you know, and this yeah. is, this is one of them. So yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same way. It's I feel very, very fortunate to have you know encountered this and get its healing benefits, and I want to share it with others. Yeah. And you know, especially in my work, um, you know, in therapy, I, not all of my clients are you know psychedelic integration clients. I have clients right. from that don't have any background with that. And when I see someone that's really struggling and suffering, and I think this can help, you know, it's like. I want to be able to offer that and, and share that yeah, with them and help them right. connect to that because it can really be transformative and life-changing in a, in a way that, you know, other modalities take a long, long time and require lots and lots of effort and work and dedication. And even then it, you know, you, you can't always get there in the same way, but I would also caveat that it's not for everybody, you yeah. know, ayahuasca, there are, um, I don't know if risks are the right word, but it's, it's, it's not a good fit for every person and it can be destabilizing. Um, you have to really be prepared for it and accept that you're stepping into this unknown that can be life-changing in ways you can't predict and be okay with that. Um, so, you know, it's something to really be thoughtful about in terms of, um, sharing as well. Yeah. Are, are, you know, speaking of that, like what, who would you say would maybe not be quite the right fit for ayahuasca or are there certain mental health issues that you look for that it's like, that's not going to be a good space for you to enter, um, possibly even like drug interactions, maybe speaking on that, but like, what would make that a not so great experience for someone? Well, there's definitely some, some basic safety, um, aspects that you have to, um, you know, hurdles you have to clear to make sure it's safe. So one mm-hmm. is um, ayahuasca increases blood pressure a lot during the ceremony. Anyone with either high blood pressure or really any history of serious, um, uh, any kind of heart condition, heart disease, that's a very high risk situation. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's not something I think that's safe to do. Another um, reason not to just brew it in your house and do it. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. People, you know, it's, it's you really have to screen for yeah. these things. Um, so the heart, uh, heart is one major factor. And the other is, um, serotonin syndrome. This is kind of the other main mm-hmm. risk, which is people who are taking, um, SSRIs or even other psychoactive medications that boost serotonin, SNRIs, et cetera, um, antidepressants, uh, um, as well as even certain other psychoactive substances like benzodiazepines and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. basically if it, if it boosts serotonin, that could be a dangerous combination with ayahuasca because you are not only massively boosting it, but you're using an MAO inhibitor that kind of keeps it elevated. Right. And so there have been very, very few actual reports of it, but it is considered medically the other big risk factor is that um, to do it while you're on an SSRI mm-hmm. um, and that you really need to clear off of it weeks before. But in general, I'd say don't do it with any, any medications at all. It's just the safest, clearest right. way is go in there medication free. And that's right. going to give you the kind of the safest. Um, so those are the two big risk factors medically. Yeah. Yeah. You know, psychologically, there are others. Um, 
I don't recommend it for people who are already kind of tenuous with their hold on reality because it's going to loosen that temporarily. Yeah. And that can, if you already sell, or, you know, have a propensity towards that, it can really destabilize people. So mm-hmm. not good to do it if you're in an unstable place already, either psychologically or emotionally too unstable, meaning lots of ups and downs, lots of intensity of emotion. Ayahuasca is a great, like a lot of psychedelics amplifier. So it will yeah. amplify things while you're under it. And sometimes that can persist afterwards. Thanks for that. Appreciate that. And I, I, this is just me uh, curious. Um, what, <laughs> this is like this is like asking what one of your which kid is your favorite. But do you have like a a favorite? Would ayahuasca be your favorite if you had to be like we can only have one left? Yeah. Which which medicine would be your favorite? Well, for me, it's ayahuasca. I've made a commitment yeah. to this medicine. It's yeah. It's my primary teacher guide. Yeah. It's the medicine I work with. It has changed my life. And it also, I just enjoy it. I like the way it feels. I like the way it, yeah. it, it you know, the, I like the visionary state in right. it. There's a clarity that just, it just, I'm very simpatico with it. And yeah, I can't say that about all the other ones. I've, you know, explored lots of different psychedelics and they're all powerful in different ways. But yeah. for me, ayahuasca is the number one and it's kind of the head of my medicine world is yeah. the ayahuasca medicine. I think if I had the opportunity to work with it more, I might f- feel the same. I love mushrooms. I, I love some I, mushrooms feel like yeah. ayahuasca's little kid sister. <laughs> it's like uh, this very, it's like a, something you could do more frequently. I feel like in between ayahuasca yeah. that kind of gets you into a similar state. And I love the connection to nature that I feel yeah. when I'm on, on mushrooms as well. Same. Yeah. yeah, it's a similar, beautiful, connective experience. And then also like you, you said, simpatico and that reminded me. So I, I have a degree in Spanish, really okay. random. And I noticed you studied uh, like South Latin American studies at Columbia was like oh, your undergrad. Yes. Do you, yeah. I, I just had to ask, like, do you feel like is, is, that's interesting, right? Like how yeah. your career evolved. I mean, you went on this, like eat, pray, love, like <laughs> you right. walk about and like ended up in Latin yeah. America serving medicine. That's so interesting. Did you ever feel that way? Um, well, you know, the, the backstory is my mother's Argentine and okay. I was born in Nicaragua and I, okay. I spent several years of my childhood in Chile. So I've yeah. had a kind of Pan American upbringing okay. and um, feel very attached to my Latin American side and heritage and yeah. music and culture and the language. So that was actually why I, I, you know, I wanted to spend some time in Latin America, countries I hadn't been to before in particular. Yeah. So that definitely was a part of it because it's that, you know, I just feel very at home in South totally. America. So totally. I, and I, being up here in the North, I miss, you know, I miss the language, I miss the culture, I miss the people. So even though obviously the Amazon is a very, you know, all the countries are different. Every subsector is different. The Amazon um, kind of mestizo culture is its own very unique, interesting world. That's a lot mixed in with so much traditional indigenous Amazonian practices and languages and traditions and even syntax. It's fascinating. Right. But there was a homeliness to me, um, living there because of, you know, that my, my, my background. Yeah. Totally. Uh, did you learn any indigenous languages while you lived down there? No. Um, I mean, I, you know, my teacher was Mestizo, so he, he, he speaks Spanish, although I don't think almost anyone who even speaks Spanish would understand him unless you spend a lot of time with him because it's the, 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 how they speak is so different and it's the syntax, how they, describe things even you know they turn nouns into verbs and vice versa it's really hard you know people that are even native spanish speakers don't you know i'd have to translate for them because it's hard to follow yeah um but so no i did not pick up any indigenous language my my sister-in-law is peruvian and she speaks quechua she grew up speaking oh cool wow yeah so different so different i'm like what yeah um uh, also I wanted to, um, point out real quick. I noticed that you have done Vipassana retreats, you know, you are Vipassana yeah. experiences. Um, yeah. could you explain what that is? And I mean, 15 years of practice from three to 21 days, you say on your website, that's yeah. amazing. Can you share what that is and, and what you've learned? Sure. From that? Yeah. So, uh, Vipassana or inside meditation is a, is a type of meditation that comes from Buddhism, from the Theravada tradition of Buddhism. Um, I first encountered it through a teacher named Goinka, who has 
um, essentially these retreat centers all over the world um, that are self contained. So it's, he's passed away since they're all kind of self operating volunteer run centers, donation, um, you know, donation based, really traditional. Um, and I did a 10 day retreat there when I was 22. I think it was really That's challenging cool. and um, physically very tough 10 days in silence, you know, meditating. It's like 12 hours a day. It's, it's hardcore. It's a monastic style of retreat. Um, but it was life changing for me then. Um, you know, it really opened up my understanding of how the body and the mind were connected in a way I'd never mm. really understood or yeah. never appreciated. And that, wow. in many ways, that kind of was a significant step on my spiritual journey of yeah. learning about self and life and the universe. And, um, you know, I've stuck with it on and off for many, many years. I, I think meditation, formal meditation is a great practice for plant medicine, because yeah. it helps you to stay centered when you're right. being thrown around by everything totally. that's coming up and the intensity of the experience to be able to just yeah. sit and witness what's happening and be clear and present. is super helpful. Yeah. So it's a great tool for ayahuasca. And in general, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a big believer that psychotherapy and meditation and plant medicine work together are a very powerful, like synergistic Mm -hmm. way a way of working together that can be very helpful and counteract some of the negatives of each of them so i think there's mm -hmm. kind of weaknesses or vulnerabilities to each mm -hmm. of those and um those three together are a great recipe I, i'm actually been writing an article on this for like a year that i haven't finished on <laughs> the kind of pros and cons of each and why working with mm -hmm. all three can be a very powerful recipe for life transformation um, so yeah. the Pashna was just the style that I learned and I ended up going to Burma and doing a retreat there and yeah. Thailand and other places. Wow. Um, but it's the nice thing about it is it's very accessible and, you know, there's like, I live in California. I think there's four different, the Pashna retreat centers in yeah. California and because it's donation based, it's super affordable. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I second what you're saying. Cause when I, first started doing plant medicines, I did not have a meditation practice in place at all. I had never meditated. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember having this one moment where I was like, I don't like being in my own mind in silence. I don't like yeah. it. I want to talk to somebody. I want to listen <laughs> right. to music, like anything, yeah. but just silence in my own mind. And, yeah. and after getting a meditation practice in place and, and through many journeys, I remember having this moment where I, I wanted to get away from everybody and just be by myself in silence. Yep. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I have come a long way. You know, that's so, a huge shift. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, that's amazing. I, I have not done a Vipassana retreat, but I would love to, especially because I'm so connected to the body and, and I'm so grateful for it. I think that like you yeah. mentioned before, the gratitude that comes in for life is yeah. something that I've heavily experienced through these sacred journeys. It's yeah. just like, we're so lucky it's in, and the universe yeah. is here to support us and wants what's best for yeah. us. And, you know, so anyway, it would be cool to experience. I can only imagine the gratitude and awareness, the level of awareness yeah. created from that much silence would be insane. It does. You go very <laughs> deep. And the yeah. 20 day, the 21 day one was, I mean, oh my gosh, it's that's, hard though. I would that's, just say, I was like, that's gangster level. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, that's nothing. There's people who do 90 days, oh and, my you know, gosh. year long retreats. I mean, what? 21 was like, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever do this again. And if I do, it'll be a long time from now. Cause it was that hard, but I just think these oh. types of retreats are really hard work, yeah. even 10 days in silence, sitting, no contact. It's, it's uh, challenging. People leave in the middle of these frequently. I, I would say every retreat I've gone on, someone left or like tried to sneak out or something like that. Wow. wow. Um, because it's, it's so they're worth it. Definitely. But there were periods in the middle where it's like, why am I doing this? This is so painful. <laughs> what, right. You know, I'm just sitting here and it feels like someone's hammering on my knees because I'm in so much physical pain and wow. it can be really tough, but definitely worth it. Wow. Super cool. Um, okay. So, uh, real quick, I, I know people are going to ask, so do you have recommendations on places for people to go to do ayahuasca? Um, yes, I can. I probably, I'm not sure I'd want to do this on a podcast format, but if someone wants to email me, I'm happy Perfect. to recommend somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then your website is transcendentcouncil.com. 
Yes. Right. Yep. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then you're, you're based in San Francisco, correct? I am, or now I'm in Berkeley. In Berkeley. Yep. Okay. And, yeah. and do you do remote work with people over zoom? Yeah. Or is I'm it all like remote. Office? Um, okay, I, even remote. before COVID, I was doing one day okay. a week and just, awesome. just seeing people in different parts of the country, but now awesome. um, I'm all remote. Yeah. Okay. Right on. So we'll link that in the show notes, guys. Um, it's transcendentcouncil.com. Alex, thank you so much for coming and sharing that thank with you, us today. Thank you, Carlos. Really, really it. enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs>